Um, so where were we? We were talking about heteroscedasticity, how to test for it. Today we're going to start talking about how to correct for it. And then I'll do an example. There will also be examples done in the lab. And you get to do it live on your homework. But again, I'll do one just like your homework problem. The one they'll do in a lab is a little further away from the homework problem. It's exactly the same technique. So hopefully by the end of the day, we'll know all the things we need to know about that. Ah, what else? Anything else we need to talk about? Um, yeah, let's just go on. If I think of something, we'll do that later. So we're going to, this is Hal White at UC San Diego. We're going to do a White's test next. And this is what we call essentially a non-parametric test. So the first point about White's test is it does not rely upon a specific form of heteroscedasticity. So, so far we've really looked at um, four models of heteroscedasticity, but we needed a model to reduce the parameter space so we could actually estimate it. We looked at four models of heteroscedasticity. One that said sigma i squared is alpha x squared, something along those lines. One was the model A, sigma squared is A plus B, Z, T, sigma, log sigma, those four models. So our previous test required that we model the heteroscedasticity. This does not. That means you don't have to know the exact form. Now, is that better or worse? Well, it depends. If you impose a true restriction on a model, it improves efficiency. Because randomness will pull you away from that restriction a little bit. And that'll, if it's really true, you want, to, you want to make it true in the data. So by imposing it, you don't let randomness in the data sort of pull you away from the restriction a little bit. So when you impose a restriction on the data, it makes things better. You're imposing something true and making sure it shows up in your results. And the data can't pull you away from that truth, even if you get a weird data set. And so it's more efficient if you, exact, if you know the exact restriction, if you know the exact form of the heteroscedasticity, it's more efficient to model it. So if you're fairly certain you have scale um, heteroscedasticity, writing down a specific model is useful. It could be very helpful. But if you impose a false restriction on a model, you make things far worse. And so when you use a parametric model, there's an advantage. If you're correct, it's much better. There's a disadvantage. If you're wrong, it's much worse. And so the use of parametric models depends critically upon your confidence, your knowledge of the form of the underlying heteroscedasticity. Now, theoretically, sometimes you'll know a lot about that, sometimes you won't, and it really depends. It's always, I think, a good idea to do White's test as a check against misspecification. If you're getting the same answer both ways, it's not a big deal. If you get different answers, White finds it, the other doesn't, or the other way around, then you've got more to think about. You need to think about the, the, how correct your model is that you're using. But in any case, this doesn't rely upon any specific form of heteroscedasticity. We often, most often, don't know a lot about it. So this is a real advantage to have this kind of a test available. You often won't know a lot about it, so you'll do this. On your projects, I'll probably want you to do both, do this. But this is just push a couple of buttons and you're done. I'll probably also want you to try the other ones just to show me you can do it. And then comment on which one you think is better. So that I know that you understand the kinds of things I just talked about. So the project, when we do them, I'm not going to care a lot what your question is, what answers you find. What I'll care about is you demonstrate that you know and understand how to use the things we developed in class. And this would be an example where you could do both. Okay, I did this test, I did this test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with whites because I think I don't have a good idea of the parametric structure of my errors, or I do, or whatever. And then I, I really know you understand the underlying issues, which, which is what I want to see on the project. And whether you find it or not, you know, as on the test set. Okay, so that's the first point about White's test. Um, it's closely related to model A 
in the uh, parametric test, but it's not model A, but, but it's kind of like it. Um, it's a large, you know what this means, large sample LM test. If not, don't, don't worry too much about this, but this is another, um, anyway, it's another Lagrange multiplier test, but let's not worry too much about it. This is important. It does not require normality of the errors. The other tests that we did, you had to have a parametric, you had to impose a particular distribution. I can't talk and write at the same time. So uh, let me write and then talk so I don't get both of them wrong. Um, oh, you're catching up. Let me talk after you catch up. So um, most of the tests we've done so far, in order to get an F distribution or a chi-square distribution, whatever distribution the test is, I think we're using chi-squares. Um, so depending. Um, you don't need normality of the errors here. So it's robust to distributional assumptions, to different distributions of errors. That, that's important because Although, maybe this is a good approximation. Sometimes your errors aren't normal at all, especially when you have misspecifications, and this test will still work. I mean, I, there's limits to how bad it would be, but, but for the most part, it will still work. Okay, and for these reasons, it's usually the recommended test. It's just more robust to parametric errors, more robust to distributional errors. Um, it's a lot like the first test anyway. So if you're going to do the first test, this one's probably just as good, maybe better in most cases. So let me give you an example of how to do this. Later on today, I'll show you how to do it in EDU. So let's say that yi beta 1 plus beta 2 x2i. Try to slow down and write meter, which will last about 10 minutes. Then I'll do my old sloppy self. At least you can think that I care. I try. Um, yt, that is beta 1 plus beta 2x2i plus beta 3x3i plus ui. Then we're going to assume, now in this model, what you, and remember that, that the variance of ui is sigma squared i. And it's that i that's the problem. It's different for every observation. i is 1 to n. If there was no i there, if it was the same sigma squared, we don't have a problem. So White's model assumes a particular structure of the, it's, it's not a particular structure, it's what we call a flexible form. So we're going we're gonna to actually have a parametric form in some sense, but it's what we call a flexible functional <coughs> form. And it'll fit most anything. And so there's certain types of flexible forms you can use in econometrics that are, that are very good at fitting whatever the underlying truth is. They're very flexible in terms of how they can fit. And so what, we're, what you do in this test is you take all the variables themselves like before, all the squares of the variables, and all their cross products. It's always the same. So our model of the variance will be sigma squared i is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 um, x2i plus alpha 3 x3i plus alpha 4 x2i squared plus alpha 5 x3i squared plus alpha 6 x, 2i, x, 3i. So you take the x's that are in your model, now the, the, and this is why we use z's before, because they're not the same as all the x's. But anyway, so you just take your x's, take all their squares, and take all their inner products. If I had three x's, There'd be b2, b3, b2, b4, b3, b4, and so on. So they're all the inner products that are unique. You wouldn't have b2, b3, and b3, b2, because that's the same thing. Or x2. So, so this is the model. You don't actually end up having to estimate this. It's what you do, actually. I'm sorry. 
You don't when you push the buttons, but you do when you do it yourself. So here's the steps involved in the test. Can you anticipate what they'll be? We're going to estimate this model. What will we save? UI squared. UI squared will be an estimate of this. We'll use UI squared from this first regression as an estimate of sigma I squared. We'll regress UI squared on these variables. Then we'll look at NR squared as our test statistic, and that's going to be a chi-square test statistic. How many restrictions do I need to make this variance constant? I need alpha 2, alpha 3, 4, 5, and 6. If those are all 0, what's the variance? It's a constant. So the null hypothesis that we're headed for is that alpha 2 through alpha 6 are 0. <coughs> constant variance versus at least one is non-zero. If at least one is non-zero, we have heteroscedasticity. If we fail to reject that there's zero, homoscedasticity. So estimate this model. Save the UI squareds. Estimate this model. The, t, the statistic is nR squared, and that's chi-square of the number of restrictions. In this case, it'll be a chi-square of 5, because 5 of the alphas have to be 0. So I'll be more specific about the hypothesis in a minute here, I believe. Actually, I wasn't. So let me write down the hypothesis before we do the steps. So the null that we want to test is alpha 2 equals alpha 3 equals alpha 4 equals alpha 5 equals alpha 6 equals 0. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 restrictions. The, the alternative is at least one is non-zero. So one estimate by OLS, this model here. Estimate this model by OLS. Now the next step the computer does for you because it saves that variable called resid, but I'm going to write it as a second step because not all packages do that, and just to make the steps clear. So the second step is to find u hat i equals y i minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x 2i minus beta 3 hat x 3i. So we estimate the initial model, and then we just find the estimate. This is resid in the program. So you don't have to, this, this just happens automatically in the background <coughs> with any of you. But technically, you should, you should do this. Later on, we're going to need to figure out, oh, I'll come back to that. Let's not confuse things there. Now regress u hat i squared on constant x2, x3, x2 squared, x3 squared, x2, x3. I don't have my computer open. <laughs> Be like you all. And we're essentially done. Find n times r squared. So this is the goodness of fit, and that's the number of observations. This is distributed chi-square with five degrees of freedom.
So you look up NR, you look up the chi square five in the back of the book and compare it to NR squared. Very simple test. Another reason for its popularity. So you just compare NR squared to the critical value. for the chi-square 5 test, then, I'm getting sloppier, except, when I was younger, that meant something else, or reject as appropriate. So on your homework, I've asked you to do White's test. As I said, there's a button you can push in the program that does the test automatically. For the first time at least, I want you to do it explicitly yourself. Run this regression find the test statistic by hand and so on. Doesn't mean you won't be able to check it with the program. You can. But I want you to go through the steps because there's some intuition here on underlying it. Yeah. Estimation is next. Um, so we've done the test. We, let's say we found heteroscedasticity. We know OLS is inefficient. What do we do? Well, we use the efficient procedure, which is called feasible generalized least squares. So we're going to generalize the least squares procedure to handle heteroscedasticity. And along the way, we'll do some algebra that hopefully makes it all clear. The first and the simplest, simple because we're not going to do anything theoretical with it, is White's correction. So the first way to correct this is just White's. So how White not only has a test, he has a correction. So White's correction. It's called White's. heteroscedastic consistent covariance matrix. Don't worry about that. So you often see this as an HCCM procedure. So when you look at a lot of packages, it'll just tell you that you're using the HCCM procedure, the heteroscedastic consistent covariance matrix estimator. It's White's correction. That's what that means. Now, we don't want to talk about maximum likelihood and in information matrices yet, but this relies upon some particular characteristics of something called the information matrix, which comes out of something called maximum likelihood, which is something we'll do week 10 on the last day of class, just so you've seen it. So we're not going to dig in and figure out how this correction works. It's just too much for us. It takes too much matrix algebra, and it takes parts of statistics we haven't done yet, maps and likelihood. So this one is, you go to the computer, you push the button, and it magically works. And there's a lot of matrix algebra and stuff about statistics underneath it that ensures that it works right. But this is a non-parametric test. Essentially, it just reweights things appropriately. We talked about heteroscedasticity. The problem with OLS is that you give too much weight to the vari variables that have a high variance and too little weight to the ones with a little variance. Essentially, this is a reweighting procedure that takes care of that problem. So they all essentially take care of that problem by reweighting a reweighting scheme of some sort, and this is no exception. 
So I'm debating whether to show you how to do this now that it's fresh or to do it when I do the other ones at the end. Uh, let's do it at the end. So I'll do this all in one big thing at the end. Let me do the corrections for the other model first, then I'll go on the computer at the end and show you how to do this one. Sort of changing my mind here. Let's do that one. Okay, the second way is called generalized or weighted least squares. <coughs> there are what are called GLS estimators, generalized least squares. There's something else called WS, WLS estimators, weighted least squares. You've looked at ordinary least squares so far. This lives in two worlds. It's both a GLS and a WLS procedure. Not all of them are. Not every procedure lives in both those worlds, but this one happens to. Probably easiest understood as a reweighting scheme is a weighted least squares. But so we we we, we weight the we reweight the observations as um, as I just described. But I'll explain what the GLS is all about too. So Okay, so let's start with that same model that I just erased, good for me, and then um, we'll use that as our example on how to do this. And presumably you could generalize it to any number of variables. So I'm using a constant in two x's case, how many fingers are A constant in two x's case, you should easily see how to generalize this to any number of x's. Right? Just trying to make it simple. All right. <coughs> So for this procedure, and in a little while we're going to have to talk about feasible generalized least squares. So this isn't feasible yet, but this is um, what we want to look at. So the model we'll look at is the same one. Yi is beta 1 plus beta 2, slow down, x2i plus beta 3, x3i plus ui. And again, sigma squared i equals the variance at i. Variance for obs i for the error. <laughs> or error i. I should be wrong. You know what that is already. So let's take this data and reweight it. Let me do it as a reweighting scheme, first of all, to make it seem simple. Suppose we know sigma squared. We don't, but we can get estimates of it later. So for now, suppose we know it. We don't. That's what makes us infeasible. But it guides us exactly to a feasible procedure because we know how to estimate this thing. We're going to pretend first that we know it. Then we'll figure out what to do. Then we'll say, well, we don't know it. How can we get an estimate of it? Once we have an estimate of it, we can just do what we're doing here with the estimate. So this is setting us up for, for the, the way we're going to do it soon. So let's take the data and reweight it. So I'm going to make yi over sigma i. 1 over sigma i. Remember, there's a 1 in front of here. That's the variable. There's actually a b1 times 1. There's an x1i, which is all 1s. So this is 1 over sigma i, take, transforming that variable. x2i over sigma i. And x3i over sigma i. So all I'm doing, I'm not changing the model at all. I'm just dividing both sides of the model by sigma. So I'm just taking this model and dividing both sides of it by sigma i. So my new model would be yi over sigma i. Later we'll call this yi star. We'll give it a new name. But yi over sigma i is beta 1 times 1 over sigma i plus beta 2 x 2i over sigma i plus beta 3 times x 3i over sigma i plus ui over sigma So if we knew sigma, we, we could do that. So we'll call this regression. We'll say, okay, this is yi star. 
is beta 1 x1i star plus beta 2 x2i star plus beta 3 x3i star plus ui star. So we, we just, in our spreadsheet, we would say, um, you know, <coughs> equals x3 over sigma. Because you'd have data on sigma, you have data on xi, you just form this new variable. And you'd run this regression on the transformed data with the stars. This original model is not blue because we have heteroscedasticity. I claim, and we'll show in just a second, that this model is blue. We'll get the best linear unbiased estimate of the betas because we no longer have heteroscedasticity. If I square this, what do I get? I get ui squared over sigma i squared. If I take the expected value of that, I get sigma i squared over sigma i squared, which is 1. So I no longer have heteroscedasticity. I'll do that in a second. But, but that's what makes it work. So we've taken it, and this is going to be a trick we're going to use over and over and over and over again whenever we hit uh, problems with these models. We'll say, how can I transform the data in a way that recovers the Gauss Markov assumptions? Is there a way to transform this data very simply so that when I'm all done, the model that I run still has the betas there that I can, because I, I want to estimate these things. That's the whole goal. That's what we're trying to find out is the betas. Is there a way to transform the data and get a blue estimate of the betas? And in this case, it turns out that they are. So let's, let's make sure we see that, that we've solved the heteroscedasticity problem with that star model. So what's the variance of ui star? So. This only had one problem of all, you know, we had that whole list of assumptions for the Gauss Markov theorem. You told me them on your first homework. So whatever they were, okay. The only problem was this. We've solved it. So have we solved it? So what's the variance of ui star? Well, that's the variance of ui over sigma i, right? That's just by definition. I define ui star to be that. <coughs> What's the variance of ax if x is a random variable and a is a constant? a squared times the variance of x, right? Remember how that works? <coughs> the variance a plus bx, where x is a random variable, those are constants, is b squared times the variance of x. So we have a multiple, it comes out as a square. Why doesn't the constant change the variance? All the constant is doing is shifting this distribution around, it doesn't change its spread. So if I add a to this, say this is x, this is x plus a, I just get the same distribution in a new place. <coughs> control C, control V. Same exact thing. And so it doesn't change the spread at all to add a constant to it. When you multiply by a constant, because you're taking the expected value of x minus x bar squared, taking the expected value of ax minus ax bar squared, you get an a squared pulled out when you calculate the variance, because the variance involves a squaring. The expected value of x minus x bar squared, when you multiply it by a, it's ax minus ax bar squared, which is a squared times x minus x bar squared. So you get a squared variance of x. I'm assuming this is all hat, and looking at me like, uh oh. So either, that, that, that look means two things. I have no clue what you're talking about, or move on, because I'm really bored. Times are just lost over. <laughs> I can't read you. Anyway, so this is 1 over sigma i squared times the variance of ui. Because this is just a number. It's a constant. It's not a random variable. It's a number. Or an estimate. Well, it would be a random variable. It's not a random variable. What's the variance of ui? sigma i squared. So this is 
1 over sigma i squared times sigma i squared, which is that, which is 1. Homoscedastic. The variance is 1 everywhere. We don't have heteroscedasticity anymore. So by reweighting the x's and the y's, we can solve the heteroscedasticity problem. If we know sigma, we don't know sigma, uh, but we can use those models we have, model A, B, and C, to estimate sigma and make this procedure work. Now, notice what you're doing. If this variance was really small, say it was 0.000001, what's it do to the x? Blows it up. Makes it more important. Gives it more weight. That's the weightage part. When this variance is really, really, really big, what happens to the x? It's downweighted. So you're re-weighting according to, the, you're giving the stuff with small variance more importance by making the x's grow, and you're making the things with big variance less important by downweighting them, dividing by the sigma. And it's that re-weighting of the observations we've been talking about that makes this procedure optimal again. Now we're giving each variable the right weight, the exact weight <coughs> it needs uh, to give you the best possible answer. So this, this is, this is weighted least squares. So all those variants, all those sigma i's are different, correct? Yes. So sigma i and x2i yes. is different than x3. Yes. So what you would have, you'd have, a, you'd have data. So your spreadsheet would, hit, would, would have yi and a bunch of data. This is internal. We don't usually put it on the spreadsheet, but this would be all ones. Then you have x2i, x3i data. And we're assuming you actually know sigma squared i. So you have a set of data on your spreadsheet that you just pull from someone. And we don't know that data. We're imagining, we're giving ourselves the perfect setup here. Then you just calculate that divided by that, that divided by that, that divided by that, and that divided by that as new columns. Those are your star variables. So the next column is going to be y star i, and it'll just be a11 divided by a, b, c, d, e11. Uh, to the 0.5. Because this is squared, I need to divide by sigma. And this column would be x1 over sigma. This column would be x2 over sigma, x3 over sigma. So you're just defining these star variables over here in your spreadsheet. And then you're going to run a new regression. Does that help? But again and again and again, the problem, we don't know these. except in very rare circumstances. <coughs> what do we do? Well, we get an estimate of it. And so we run the model once, give an estimate of this, put that in our spreadsheet, then use the estimate to correct. And as long as the estimate is consistent and unbiased, at least in large samples, we'll get the same answer. Because when, when n gets big enough, that estimate will go to the true sigma squared. So for large n, it shouldn't make a lot of difference whether we're using the actual value or the estimate. As n gets smaller and smaller, of course, there's more variability in your estimates, and, and the procedure doesn't work quite as well. But uh, there's more variability in it. It still works. So that's where we're headed. That's what we're going to Debating with myself over something. Okay, you, unless you've had linear algebra, you can just watch for a second. But let me just, for the people who might ever go on, show you something about the estimator here. 
you can write a model using matrix algebra in this way. So this is a column. This is y1 to yn. So this is a vector. This is a matrix. So the first column is all ones. This is x21 up to x2n. And if it's three variables, this would be x31 to x3n. But you can go out to k variables. Then you have all the betas, beta 1 to beta k, in this case beta 3, the way I've done it. Then you have all the errors, E1 up to En. I guess I've been calling them U's. Let me make that consistent. And so that's the model in matrix algebra form. If you've had matrix algebra, when you multiply, you multiply row times column. So you get y1 is beta 1 plus beta 2x2 plus beta 3x3 plus u1. That's the first observation. y2 is that times that. The so y2 is x2 to beta 1 plus beta 2x22 beta 3x32 plus u2 and so on. So this, this is a way to conveniently write all the data in one simple form. When you do this, it turns out that the estimator here is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. This is the sum of the xi minus x. Remember the standard estimator is the sum of the xi minus x bar squared times yi minus y bar, not squared, over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. So that's what you learned with, was beta hat in the two variable model. See this xy? That's xy. This is the sum of the xi squared in matrix algebra. x prime x is the sum of the x's squared. You're taking x squared essentially. So there's this x's squared. Here's the xy's. Then the bar thing works out by itself. So that's called the OLS estimator. What we're doing in these procedures, and again, if you haven't had linear algebra, none of this is going to make any sense. Uh, we say that the variance of u is omega. So this is what we call the variance-covariance matrix. So what you can do with the errors is you can line them up from u1 to un. That's u prime and u1 to un. So we set them up this way. So you get a whole matrix. This is n by 1, 1 by n. You get an n by n matrix out of this. The first element of this sigma, that's the u1 squared term. So this is the variance of the first observation. So this is sigma 1 squared down to sigma n squared. Those are the things we're worried about. So when you multiply these together, you get u1 squared. That's your sigma 1 squared, essentially. When you multiply these together, you get a sigma n squared. Now off diagonal, you get a bunch of ui, uj terms. Like, like u1, u2, u1, u3, u1, u8. We have an assumption that the errors are uncorrelated. So this, so our assumption about this matrix, one of our assumptions is there's no correlation among the errors. Next chapter, we're going to say, okay, what if that's not true? Well, what that means is you have a zero here and a zero here. So everything but the diagonal, this variance covariance matrix, is a zero. Heteroscedasticity says that this whole thing has to be the same. Every one of these has to be the same. So the problems that you can run into are twofold. Either the elements along the diagonal of your variance covariance matrix of your errors are not the same heteroscedasticity, or there's correlation among your errors, which is what we call autocorrelation. The next chapter will solve that. So what you can do, the problem is that your error is not, your error, your, your variance covariance matrix is not diagonal, and the diagonal elements don't, um, <coughs> The problems are twofold. You have non-zero off k 
can be twofold, non-zero off-diagonal elements and unequal elements along the diagonal. Now it turns out that the variance is a positive definite matrix. Maybe you know what that means, maybe you don't. A positive definite matrix can always be decomposed as QV, Q transpose. There always exists a Q and a V, so that I can write this matrix this way. This thing is diagonal. And if you've had matrix algebra, you know that the eigenvalues are on the diagonal, and these are the eigenvectors. There's actually a use for eigenvalues and eigenvectors when you, when you go on along here. Okay. There's another way to do this. I can make V equal to I without, an, without loss of generality. So I'm going to make this the identity matrix. It's all ones on the diagonal. So there always exists a Q such that that is true. What I'm going to do is find a way to transform the model so that instead of having this variance covariance matrix, I have this one. So this sounds really hard, but what you do as you estimate this model just the way you guys have estimated it, you get this thing and you decompose it. There's a command that will decompose this into these two pieces, Q and Q transpose. So you take the variance covariance matrix that comes out of the, the estimation and you decompose it. Then you just reweight your data. You say, okay, I'm going to take Q inverse Y equals Q inverse X beta plus Q inverse U. This is what we did. Our Q was 1 over sigma i, believe it or not. So we decompose the variance. Ours is really easy because it's our matrix is just, there's zeros here and here, our problem. These are just sigma squareds. So Q, Q, i is just sigma i times sigma i. Q inverse is 1 over sigma i. So it's really simple in our case. So this, this Q inverse is just 1 over sigma i for us. It's a really simple thing. But in general, this will always work because if you look at the variance of this thing, you look at the expected value of Q of U transpose Q inverse transpose Q inverse U, you'll get, um, ah, I did it backwards. If you look at the variance of Q inverse U, U prime, Q inverse, if you look at that, that variance, covariance matrix, I, I wrote this backwards. This should have been on the other side. Sorry. Because that has to be that way. Um, if you take that expectation, you get Q inverse. This is omega Q inverse transpose. So you get, sorry, you get Q inverse U, U prime Q inverse transpose. And you take that expectation, you get Q inverse omega Q inverse transpose. But if you look over here, Q inverse omega Q prime Q inverse transpose is the identity matrix. So this is the identity matrix. So this, once you make this transformation, this gives you the identity matrix back. Okay, now you can't say we never did any hard math in here. I know you didn't get any of that. <laughs> it's for the people on the film. But, so there's, a, there's this procedure when you use matrix algebra where you can generalize this. The point I wanted to make is that this is called the, this thing here then you can, is called the GLS estimator. So you can take these transformed data and you can use this x prime x inverse x prime y. If you just put in those definitions, you'll get, um, you'll get x prime omega inverse x inverse x prime omega inverse y. And that's called the GLS estimator. So there's a way, this is the general form of the OLS estimator. And all you're doing is reweighting by the variance covariance matrix. So you're dividing through somehow on both sides by this variance covariance matrix. 
Sorry, that didn't go as smoothly as I hoped. Oh well, we killed some time. Why is uh, U and U prime equal to omega? So what we have, we want to take the expected value of U1 to Un, times U1 to Un. That's U, U prime. <coughs> so this is the expected value of U1 squared, U1, U2, U1, U3. If I'm just taking 3 by 3, this will be U2, U1, U2 squared, U2, U3, U3, U1, U3, U2, and U3 squared. We've assumed, when we take the expected value, We've assumed that U1 and U2, U1 and U3 are uncorrelated. So all the errors are uncorrelated. So we take this expectation, you'll get zeros here. This expectation is sigma 1 squared, 0, 0. This is 0, sigma 2 squared, 0. This is 0, 0, sigma 3 squared. So the variance, covariance, make, these are all the sigmas we're worried about. We're just stacking them in a matrix. Then when we decompose this, I can decompose this as Q, Q prime, as this will just be sigma 1 to sigma 3 times sigma 1 to sigma 3 with zeros off diagonal. So the Q here is really easy, because when I multiply these out, I get sigma 1 squared to sigma 3 squared. So it's just sigmas on the diagonal. The Q inverse is just 1 over those. Wait, you said again how you pulled it from Q square from Sigma squared to sigma. Sure. So now we've shown that the variance covariance matrix is sigma 1 squared down to sigma 3 squared with zeros on diagonal. That's equal to sigma 1 to sigma 3 with zeros off the diagonal times sigma 1 to sigma 3 with zeros off the diagonal. This is Q. Because it's diagonal, this is Q transpose. The Q transpose inverse is 1 over sigma i. So when I take Q inverse y, I just take y over sigma i. So in this case, it's really easy. But in general, these won't be diagonal. But this trick will still work. <laughs> it's like 524, doesn't it? Sweat. If I know, I just blew it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I thought you said earlier that generates an auto correlation issue. Or is this completely If we have non zeros here. So if it's non zero, then it's an auto correlation Yes. Okay. And it, next chapter, what we'll do, we won't actually write these matrices <laughs> down again because it doesn't look like that's going to work. But next chapter, these will all be constant. They'll all be the same. They'll all be 11.3. And these will be non-zero. And we'll find a way to fix that. Then we can imagine having both problems at once. This one and this one. In that case, this matrix procedure is really the way to go. Because when I decompose that cube, it takes care of both problems all at once, rather than just one of the problems. And so this GLS procedure, you just take the variance covariance matrix, break it into two pieces. You take that variance covariance, make a Q, Q prime, and you just multiply through by Q inverse. Whether or not you have autocorrelation or heteroscedasticity, that Q inverse is going to reweight everything, both these and these, in a way that makes it work. So you, if you had matrix algebra, you're just, it's just, this is just an orthogonal transformation. So we're just taking a, a linear transformation, taking a change of basis into a new space where the variance covariance is diagonal. It's the same linear operator, it's just with respect to a different basis set. Because you have the same linear operator on a different basis set, you get the same betas. So. <laughs> All right. Well, that worked out well.
I guess that one of the points is there's a way to do this with matrix algebra that makes it all very simple. So there's another algebra that takes all this complicated stuff and really makes it pretty simple once you learn the matrix algebra. And um, but I probably took way, way, way too big of a jump there. Okay. Anyway, back to our problem. <coughs> We can't do any of this because I don't know what omega is. I don't know what sigma is. I don't know any of it. So what do we do if we don't know the sigma i? So again, our model is yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2i plus beta 3 x 3i plus ui. The variance of ui is sigma squared i. And that's our problem. Our solution is to reweight by sigma i, not sigma i, 1 over sigma i. So we reweight by 1 over sigma i, but don't know sigma i, what to do. Wait. We might not get to the example until next time. One reason I decided to do that was last, I've always taught this on Mondays and Wednesdays. And so I usually got yesterday off. So we have one extra day. So I was just killing a little time to sort of keep us on schedule. Okay, let's take the simplest case first. So the answer <coughs> is to use a model of the variance as a way to estimate it. So we'll use sigma i hat instead of sigma i. And we'll get that sigma i hat from a model. And we're going to start with one that's really easy to use because you don't actually have to do much. So here's the simplest case that I can think of. Um, let's suppose that the variance of ui is sigma squared. This is just some constant. Call it alpha if you like. It's just some number. Z t squared. This, this is known data. So we're sort of giving ourselves the variance. Because what we're saying is we know the variance up to a scale. <coughs> We actually know the variance. We just don't know if this is 2 or 3 or 4. So we know the variance up to a scale factor. That's probably more information than you're ever going to have. But sometimes, this is a decent model of the variance. I use T instead of I. No, I apologize for that. Um, my next class is all T's and not I's. So I get, just when I get the I's in my head, I go to my next one. And they say, what's those I's all about? So the simplest case is when the variance follows this model. This is almost like knowing the variance, because you know everything but, this, but the scale, what this number is. And again, that's probably more information than we have. But this will work just fine. So let's, let's see how it works. So what's the solution? Divide through by, this is sigma i squared. So what's sigma i in this model? It's sigma zi, right? This might be, you know, square foot of housing or sales of a store or income. Or, this is just some variable you know. What we're going to do is just divide by zi. We 
We'd like to bite through by sigma too, but we don't know what that is. Then we can ask ourselves, okay, what's the variance of, so this is our star model. We have yi star equals beta 1 x 1i star plus beta 2 x 2i star plus beta 3 x 3i star plus ui star, where these are, this is x 3 star x 2 star. This is u star, and so on, y star. So what's the variance of ui star? Well, that's the variance of ui over zi, which is 1 over zi squared times the variance of ui. And I'm flying again, so let me just come over here and take a sip of coffee while you catch up. <clears throat> Sorry. I get excited. This is so much fun. <clears throat> but what did we say the variance of UI was? This is 1 over zi squared times, what's this? Sigma squared zi squared times sigma squared zi squared. That's that part. We wrote that down at the beginning. We just, that was what we said was the variance. If I just square this, we started with that. What's that equal to? Sigma squared. <coughs> Homo scedasti. Now our variance covariance matrix has the same sigma squared down the diagonal. So now we have one variance, not n of them. Mm -hmm. So I can ask afterwards. Okay, I still don't understand how we're weighting these because if you're the ZI equals whatever constant, 2. ZI is not a constant. ZI changes. Okay, because if they're all, are they all being divided by the same number, or are they different numbers for each X? They're the same ZI, number for each X. So then aren't they all being weighted at the same scale? So if they're all shifted down or up, it's still yeah. relative. So how are the different XI being weighted? It's this term that you want to focus on the most. So the other ones are pretty easy. You're just trying to make it so it's all equal. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. So what we're doing is we're taking, when we have something like this, the, the best intuition is about the u's rather than the x's. You can do it the other way. But really what we're doing is we're taking, when we have these, this big variance, we're downweighting everything by dividing through by a big number. So by dividing through by that big number, we're making these less important. So when zi is big, it really downweights all of this. When zi is small, then it upweights it. And you can actually rewrite the weighted one on here with the x's moving and stuff. And it's, it's better to just think of the fact that what you want to do is just not let this have much influence. So you divide through by a big number that does that. So the re-weighting is, that, that's really what it's doing. Does that help? Is that enough? Uh, I'm just trying to like, think about in my head like, how that works. Like, would you expect a similar kind of model about like, housing prices? So as maybe the size of the house increases. Yeah, so if you want to know how, if you want to know how square footage and price are related, you might see a lot more variance between square foot and price at high house prices than at low house prices, let's say. And so what you want to do is give more weight to the low-priced houses and less weight to the upper-priced houses. One way to do that is just take those prices and downweight them so the errors are smaller. Because remember, what we're minimizing <coughs> is the sum of the UI squareds. And so the ones that are big have a lot of influence on the OLS estimator. 
what we're doing is we're giving them less influence on the estimator. We're saying, when UI squared is big, don't pay so much attention to this one. Pay less attention to it. Go ahead. If you oh, want. No, no, I just, sorry, just okay, okay. And so that's what you're doing. I think the best intuition is just think about, I just want to downweight the model when the variance is big and upweight it when the variance is small. Now in the housing price example, one assumption that we're making is that we have the same linear relationship in place between houses a square foot at the low end as we have at the high end. If, if it's not a linear model, then we have other things to worry about. But as long as that model's linear, we can get more information on the low priced house. You might think there's a different relationship, then you've got to put a dummy variable or something in there to take care of that. But, but assuming they're the same, there's no reason to look at the upper price ones because it's, it's just going to fool you about what the relationship is. So we just want to tell the procedure, ignore those, and dividing by ZI says ignore those. Because it has to do with this. This is how much weight you give in the estimator. And so an outlier under OLS really pulls the line up a lot. You don't want these outliers to pull the line very much when there's heteroscedasticity because it's just because the variance is big. So you stop the outliers from pulling, yanking the line around. And that makes it better. Now, if you're not willing to adopt such a simple model of the variance, and you stay on your feet, this won't work. So what if I don't know the variance and I'm not happy with that model? Well, then I need to, to generalize it some more. So we have three other models that we can use for the variance. <coughs> so what we can do, this is called feasible generalized least squares. Usually it seems FGLS. So we had three models of the variance. Sigma i squared, alpha 1 plus alpha 2, z2 i plus zp, alpha p, zpi. Then we had a b model, which was sigma i squared equals the same thing. Sigma squared, sorry. Then we had a c model, which is the log of sigma i squared equals. And now we're the same thing on the right hand side. So we have three models. So what we can imagine doing is exactly what you what, what you know you can see this coming, right? You estimate this model, what do you get? UI for model A you get the UI squared. Then what would you do? Use this model <coughs> Estimate this model to get an estimate of sigma i squared. You'll get sigma i squared hat. So I can use this model to estimate sigma i squared. Then I can go back and divide by yi over sigma i hat. X i over sigma i hat. So we don't know sigma i, but that's okay. We've got a model we can use to estimate it. One of these models. That's your homework. I'll do that one when I actually do it. And then... Um, so we'll estimate the original model, save the ui squareds, estimate this model, and use our estimate of sigma i to correct the original model for heteroscedasticity. Got it? That was a little higher pitch than I expected. Got it? Should look at this side of the room every once in a while. Just
Well, I was going to show you my article in the New York Times when we did the thing. <laughs> I'm not going to get there. So, go to the opinion page if you want to read something. I wrote on the, um, there's something called the Room for Debate. And I wrote something on why there's a delay between the change in GDP and the change in unemployment and why it's longer than it used to be. So, there's a debate between four or five of us there. OPB called me before class, so I'll be at OPB, and there's a quote in the Penn Register. <laughs> that was kind of dumb. Merkley's going to put out a proposal to try to increase house prices by forcing people to, um, that are in trouble on their mortgages, forcing the financial companies to write down their principal and rewrite their loans. So they wanted to know if that was a good procedure or not. So we'll talk. Anyway, so just giving you a little break here. It's been hot and heavy. Let's go back through this then. Here's the steps. the original model. Regress. Y on beta 1, beta 2, uh, on a constant. X2, Xk. K is 3 in our example. May as well generate it. Get beta hat OLS equals X prime X inverse, X prime Y, or your favorite formula. Then, second, compute, this is resid, ui hat is yi minus theta 1 hat minus theta 2 hat x2 minus minus theta k hat xk. So this is resid, save resid. Well, it's already saved for you. Then, depending on the model, So let's take 3a. That's the first model of the variance. So for 3a, you would regress ui hat squared on constant and z1 through z key. This is a constant. <coughs> Let me just do it the right way on constant z2 through z3. This, this is the model. Um, so what we're estimating here is ui hat squared is alpha 0 plus alpha 1, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z2i plus alpha p zpi plus here. So we're estimating this model. With the UI squared. See with me? Original model, save the UI squared, estimate this. That gives us alpha hats. So you'll get the alpha hats. That is the estimated model. Now I need an estimate of the variance. Sigma hat squared i is alpha 1 hat plus alpha 2 hat z2i plus alpha p hat zpi. This step will be a little bit confusing when we go to the data, but you have ui squared, but those are not the estimates. You have to use the ui squared to estimate this model and then take the estimated ui squared from this model. This, this is really ui hat squared hat hat. You've taken the estimated model. And you, anyway, this is your estimate of sigma i squared. You have to use the estimated model here to get the estimate of the sigma i squareds. Now you know what to do, right? Divide through by sigma i hat and estimate and that model will be fully efficient. We'll now have a model 
that satisfies the Gauss-Markov theorem. It's actually fully consistent. Asymptotically, it's fully efficient. When I say asymptotically, that means as the number of data points goes to infinity. But anyway, um, so but this is going to be an efficient procedure. So the next step is divide by sigma i hat, that thing, that you've got from the alpha hats. And I'll show you, this is real simple when you get in the program. I'll show you how to do these. To get this is easy. So you'll have y i over sigma i hat equals beta 1 times 1 over sigma i hat plus beta 2 times x2 i over sigma i hat plus, plus beta k x k i sigma i hat plus u i over sigma Then you just estimate what? That model. So you just estimate that model. Call this y star, x1 star, x2 star, xk star. Estimate that model, and it's fully efficient. So here's some problems with this technique. The first one is there's no guarantee that sigma hat i squared is greater than zero. When I do this estimation here, when I get this sigma i squared, it's possible that one of these are negative. There's nothing that guarantees this won't be negative. You can't have a negative variance, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. When that happens, generally what we use is the square root of u of sigma i hat squared. So if this is negative, just take the absolute value. So use the absolute value. So the correction there is just to use the absolute value. So one step here, you should probably, before you do the dividing, Right here, you should probably form a new variable that's the absolute value of this variable. Most of the time, you won't need to do that. But just to be safe, in case there's a negative variance, just take the absolute value and you'll be fine. OK, what I need to do next time is come back in here, go through this one more time slowly with models B and C, do an example so you make sure you get it, and um, then turn you loose on your homework. I'm not expecting you to have this all down in your heads yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. But work on it.